What if Eric Carr had never died and the reunion tour happened? Mike still wouldn't have been happy because he hates Eric Carr. Eric Carr was just another drummer. That's you it. You hate him. You hate him. Don't hate him. Just sure another drummer in Kiss. That's it. Just another drummer. Be part of Three Sides of the Coin. Leave a video message for us. Head over to threesidesofthecoin.com, click on the video message link, and record your three-minute video. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Michael Brandhold, and as always, I'm joined by Tommy Summers. How you doing, Tommy? Good, Mike. Um, as as always, for now. Right? <laughs> as always, for now. <laughs> we never know what kind of shit's going to hit the fan, do we? No. Nope. Well, you know, you're pushing me out. You're just. Uh, you know. Listen, that's my goal. Eventually, this will be my show. It'll be three sides of Michael Brambold. Three sides of my coin. And then you get to see all of his personalities. Exactly. I get to argue with myself. <laughs> You're just putting it on camera. I become a true Kiss fan. I argue yeah. with myself. <laughs> I'm going to have to kick my own ass because I don't agree with myself. God damn it. I love Ace. No, you don't. Oh. You hate Ace. <laughs> yeah, we want to hear from you if you've got bipolar. <laughs> Tommy does. I don't. Just a little. Um, all right, so let, let's let's do a real uh, quick bit of housekeeping here. Um, I really want to focus on our um, free smartphone apps. We've yeah. uh, been getting lots of reviews and ratings on the Google Play Store and the um, Apple iOS App Store, which is very cool. They're free for your Android devices, free for your Apple devices. Um, go download. Go download and listen to our shows. Download it. Leave us a review. Leave us a rating on there. It's very cool. We are, from what I can tell, when you go like when you go into the Apple Store, you can look at all the um, programs by the, the same developer, and our app is by the developer Spreaker, who put it out. And there's probably a couple dozen other shows, and we have more reviews and more ratings than every other show on Spreaker. Yeah, thanks. That's awesome. Thank Thanks. you guys. This is important to us. Very cool. You know, and, and to all of you who thank us on a regular basis for doing this show, you are very welcome. And that's the one thing that you can do for us is to do these reviews. And then also, obviously, share it with friends, any other KISS fans. Yep. Turn them on yep. to us. Yep. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, you can now leave voice uh, video messages. So just go to threesidesofthecoin.com, our website. Just click the link at the top or on the left side, I think it is, that says video message. And you can leave a three-minute video message for us. Um, you can answer your homework there. You can leave us questions, comments, um, whatever you want. And yep. we're going to try and include some every week when, when time permits. Um, and uh, let's just jump into some comments. What do you got for okay. today? Uh, this comes from Brad D., and it is on the YouTube channel from last week's show with uh, Leon. Um, and uh, he specifically about Phantom of the Park. And he says, my memories of Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. Number one, how excited I was waiting for it to premiere. Two, how excited I was for wa to watch it. And three, wondering what the hell I just saw when it was over. <laughs> At the same time, I really loved the concert shots and didn't think that Anthony was or excuse me, did think Anthony was a bit hammy, but great as Devereaux. Great memories for sure, but now I recognize the movie for a steaming turd that it truly was. You know, uh, I wonder how old he was when he saw it. Probably 10, I'm because guessing. I, I, I got to say, you know, I was probably 13, 14 years old, maybe 15 when that that mm -hmm. aired. Um uh, not one moment did I think it was a steaming pile of turd as I was watching it. I was just like, this is this is freaking cool. I've got like an hour and a half of nothing but kiss on TV. This is freaking amazing. You know, I was just, I was overwhelmed by the, the, just like the intensity of having so much kiss 
all at once for such a period of time because again you know you only got kiss in very very small doses on tv back then if at all right Right. So when you had a movie of the week, you didn't, I shouldn't say you, I didn't even pay attention to what the script was. I didn't pay attention to acting. I was just like, that's a kiss on TV all night. I remember thinking it took an awful lot of time to get to them. You know, first 20 minutes was just the setup, and which is, you know, part of the story. But that was my biggest thing. But I was just kind of somewhat indifferent. I just thought that Brad's comments were really funny. Oh, no, they're, um, they're, they're definitely funny. And, you know, and I got to say, looking back now, sure, it looks yeah. like a steaming pile of turds. Right. Um, but, yeah, but they it's, should it's, have it's, a, fun, it's a fun footage. pile of turds. But I'm surprised they didn't replay it more often on NBC because they own the rights to it. So you'd think that they would have pulled that out for the reunion tour or something. I don't know. Maybe it's Hanna-Barbera that owns it. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. Interesting comments from Brad yeah. in Oklahoma City. Or no, was, yeah, Oklahoma. So, um, and as always, every week now we have a new feature of collectibles from Mark. And this ain't from Spencer's. Yeah. <laughs> I got a laugh out of all of those comments. <laughs> From, from fans like, yeah, it's not Spencer's gifts that this guy's showing. Um, um, and it's not a cheap shot, people, so lay off, will you? Yeah. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this week, um, we're just going to let Mark do the talk. He always does a three-minute little video clip. And uh, Tommy hasn't even seen this yet. No, I have not. When this airs, it'll be the first time Tommy sees it. So we're just going to let this roll. And... Uh, what we want, though, is we've got to come up with a cool name for Mark's segment. Yeah, we really now, do. I don't know if it'll fly, but I got the biggest laugh out of one sh one title that was suggested called Erection from the Collection. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. You guys are... <laughs> That's funny. I don't but know. please you, you keep thumb, bringing them. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Do you like erection from the collection? You know, what do you want to call Mark's Mark's segment? You know, let's let's avoid shocker or locker. You know, that was that was Mitch's yeah, segment. This is a brand Mitch's new thing. this is a brand new segment. So yeah. come up with what you think Mark's segment should be called. Yeah. We want to hear. Yeah. So anyway, let's roll that and then we'll come back out and get started on this week's topic. Hey, Three Sides fans, uh, Mark Cicchini from Detroit Rock City, back here for round two. Last week I spent my entire allotted time uh, just talking about one item. This time I'm going to try and cram ten items or more in. Uh, let's get started. Uh, focus on pins. These are kind of cool. Um, if you have the originals, you've seen this one before. Um, there's a picture of it. But this is the very first pin that Casablanca used to promote KISS. I always like that one. And this one you've probably seen before, but this is a, and these were bootlegged here recently, but uh, this one I got from Lydia personally, and uh, these were also used for backstage passes early on. Uh, moving now to 76, everybody remembers getting this order form. Uh, there we go, there's the advertising for the button, and lo and behold, look what we got here, zingy zingy, there we go. We've got the rock and roll over button. Moving on to 1977. Kind of cool, the I Was There button. Uh, these were given away at the LA Forum for the recording of a live two. Uh, staying in 77, the uh, I always love these radio promo badges. These are cool. This is from uh, New York City for the run at Madison Square Garden. Now, this is cool. Um, this is an invite to a party. And notice the double platinum theme, and double platinum wasn't out yet. Um, and you had to have a pin. So you had to, mandatory of your pin. And here I have the mandatory pin. Oop, oop, there we go. And uh, as you can see, it's still sealed. I've had other collectors go, well, hey, how'd you get yours still sealed? And I'm like, well, the person I got it from was married to uh, one of the members of the band, and uh, they didn't need a pin to get into their husband's party. Um, moving to 79, Charlotte, North Carolina. I dig these. I love these uh, radio promo badges. I've got some from other artists, too. Um, this one's kind of cool. I recently put this on my Facebook. Um... Kiss Super Trooper. Now, these were from the last gasp of the Kiss Army. And these, uh, if you signed your friend up, this is the very last European version of the Kiss Army. 
And if you signed your friend up, you got one of those. Uh, this one's kind of cool. I don't know anyone else who has one. If you, you do, just kind of drop me on. This is from the Lick It Up tour. I got this at Cobo Hall. Um, cool pen. I don't see this one too often. Uh, speaking of promos, this one's kind of cool. Uh, if you see the colors in it, it's also on the back. You won't be able to read it because my Skype blows. But this is uh, in my eyesight, too. I don't know if it's 98 or 99. Anyways, this is a, uh, a Psycho Circus. Whoop. There we go. Psycho Circus promo. And lastly, before I go, the vault. The Hard Rock Vault. This was in Orlando. This was uh, one of the very first Kiss pins uh, Hard Rock ever did. Anyways, that's it for this week. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. I enjoyed myself. And uh, um, comments, man. Love to hear you. Talk soon. Bye. So, this week, um, kind of doing a topic that we've always said we really don't want to do. Um because yeah, we, we, qu- we get these questions asked a lot, and it's basically, what if? You guys are what if this? Awesome. What if that? What if this didn't happen? What if this did happen? And you know, because frankly, the, a discussion based on what if could be anything. You know, I could say, yeah, what? What if? What if a stayed in the band? Kiss could become bigger than you two Rolling Stones and every other band on the planet. That would be just as right as saying, well, if Ace stayed in the band, the band self-destructed 30 days later and never existed. They're both kind of equally right. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, because it's like jumping to the assumption that because Jimi Hendrix passed away, that he would have been, you know, had gone on to do 20 more albums. For all you know, he would have turned into a jazz musician and quit playing rock and roll. You don't know. Don't know. So anyway, but we get these questions so many times, and and the majority of them center around one topic. So um, we got an email. We got two emails, and I'll read both of them as as the basis for this. Um, the first one came from Brad Frakes. He goes, hey, guys, I love the show. I got two questions that I've never heard anyone talk about before. One, what if Eric Carr lives? Does the Revenge album get made? Two, if Eric Carr lives, does the reunion happen? Um, And then he just goes on to talking about some other stuff. And then we got another email from Roger Ploger, and I hope I pronounced that right, Roger. Um, I know Mike and Tommy don't really like what if questions, but I just wanted everyone's take on this thought. What if Eric Carr never passed away? The band did the reunion tour, the album, the farewell tour while keeping Eric Carr on hold till it was all over. Now when Peter Chris left, do you think they would bring Eric Carr back in the Fox makeup? Would they bring someone else in to wear the Catman makeup since they're concentrating on the makeup designs of the original four? Um, would people still think it would be a so-called tribute band if Eric Carr came back to play with Tommy Thayer? So there you go. What if, and, you know, we can, we, we can do what if segments every once in a while ongoing here if there are interesting questions. But let's get this Eric Carr stuff out of the way discussed. So okay. let's go with the first question. What if Eric Carr lives? Does the Revenge album get made? Absolutely. Uh, Eric Carr is just, he's the drummer. The direction of the band wouldn't change because he's heavy, you know, I, and that's no cut on Eric Singer, but I think that neither one of them had a huge um, influence on the way the record gets put together, you know? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree because, I mean, the Revent, first of all, Eric Carr was alive at that time. Yeah. So... The Revenge album was already being considered, worked on, however you want to deal with timelines, but it wasn't like the Revenge album happened because Eric died. Right. If he lived, he would have been the drummer on Revenge, and the only thing that I think would have been different is there wouldn't have been a tribute track to Eric Carr at the end of... And maybe he would have had a song. Yeah, he might have had a song. He might have had a song because, you know, he had one song on Hot in the Shade, but... um, I think you you you're right in saying you know sonically and direction wise I don't think the album would have been much different I mean he doesn't have doesn't didn't have much input in yeah I think the sound and direction 
Yeah, the train was already moving out of the station from Hot in the Shade towards Revenge, and Eric Singer just jumped on as the guy. Now, he, he's an incredible musician. I know that he added a lot, he, you know, his drum parts, all of that. But I think that had Eric Carr lived, it would have been no different just Eric Carr. I think it, it would have been the same songs. I think they would have had Vinny come back and do the co-writing. I think it would have been everything about it would have been the same except just a different drummer. Right. And like yep. you said, maybe one song that Eric Carr sang on. Mm -hmm. Just like I think if things kept moving forward, they probably still would have done Kiss My Ass. They probably still would have done Carnival of Souls, and Eric would have been there for that stuff. Yeah, so I, I don't think there's a big what if around the Revenge album, but what if Eric Carr lives? Does the reunion happen? Yes. So there you go. So why? Well, you know. Because it's still about the four original guys, so they would have still gone and done the tour with Peter because it's the original members and makeup I think that that is the essence of the tour no matter how uh, integral of a part that Eric played from 1980 on they would have done the tour the tour probably would have lasted and they would have milked it as long as they did with you know Singer being alive and Eric Carr not and then eventually what would have happened is, is Peter would have left the band they would have brought Eric Carr back in in Fox makeup and then what they would have done is they would have had two types of t-shirts one with Eric's face on it and one with Peter's face on it and they would still do the switching of the iconic you know figures I think they would have still marketed it as Catman but they would have probably added the Fox or something like that in there and they would have integrated it to a certain degree and they would have would not have given up on Peter's makeup. But so you said that he would come back as the Fox. P Eric would yeah, eventually why, 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 Peter why, up. Why, why so I mean here's here's I, I agree with you if the reunion still would have happened. Eric would have gotten the same meeting that Eric Singer had of, hey, we're sorry guys, but we're getting back together, you're on retainer for the next year, but you know, this is what we're doing. And quite honestly, I think everything with the original four would have played out exactly the same. Mm -hmm. They were, they were that, destined. That, that, that dynamic wouldn't change whether Eric Carr was there or not. So you would have had the reunion tour, you would have had the Psycho Circus album, you would have had the Psycho Circus tour, you would have gone into the Farewell tour, the Farewell tour would have still imploded. And you come out of Farewell U.S. going, all right, we can't deal with Peter Chris anymore. Bring Eric Carr back. So think about this. And for some of you, you may not view it this way because of your age or when you grew up with the band. But really, if you stand back and take a look at how things played out from 73 to 80, and then you take 96 to 2000, 2001, they're destined to make the exact same mistakes again. It's like when people go, well, why do, why do we keep going to war with these countries? Oh, yeah, history repeats learned. itself. It's unbelievable. So I really think that, that after 96 and they started doing all that, regardless of whether they did Psycho Circus or not, it would be the exact same thing. They'd over-commercialize and merchandise themselves. The wheels would come off. Peter would quit. They'd bring in Eric Carr. But the difference for me is, is that I felt that because of the timing and Eric Carr being the first member to replace an original member, his box makeup was much more a seated part of the band than Vinnie Vincent's was. Vinnie Vincent felt like an afterthought and we're going to sneak him on tour and never really properly introduce him because Ace is gone for a number of reasons. And so I think they could have easily gone back, brought Eric Carr back in with his Fox makeup on, toured that way, and then just had merchandise available with, with Peter Chris's face on it. See, I... I I disagree on that. I don't think he would have come back as the Fox. I think it would have played out the same way as Eric. We want you to come back, but you're going to wear Peter's makeup if you come back. Yeah, be see, I don't see that because it seems pretty clear that again, regardless of whether it was Eric Singer, Eric Carr, who was here, there, whatever, the band was moving in the direction of we are not concerned with the people we are more concerned with the iconic four makeups and i'll take shit for this but the fox is not an i can uh, not an iconic kiss makeup i agree with you but at the same time i feel like like i said it's more seated at that point and they they probably would have done it but here's another possibility what if eric would have just said fuck all of you and left and not been on retainer and then after Peter leaves, they're stuck, and Eric Carr doesn't want to come back. 
He's well, now would've, in. They would have found another drummer. Then they would have found another drummer, and then it would have for sure been if it wasn't Eric Singer, someone else to do the cat makeup. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think, I think they they would have gone back to Eric Carr first because. Mm-hmm. But we can't name. assume that he's gonna. He, we can't assume that he would have said no, yes. No, you. Well, this is the part of the what if game. You can make those rules up for whatever you want. In your mm-hmm. in your what if scenario, you could say he's not going to say yes. In my scenario. Right. Eric Carr is going to say yes because it's too big of a paycheck. It's too big of an opportunity to pass up. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm sure I'm going to take so much heat for this shit, but you know, the, You're used Eric, to it. Eric Carr and his makeup didn't have much impact beyond some real hardcore fans because right. let's, let's be honest. His makeup was around for how many albums? Two. Well, two. That was it. Two. Two albums. And both of those albums flopped. One of them they didn't even tour on in the U.S. I'm talking about. So, yes, clearly outside of the U.S. it was big. But in the U.S., Eric Carr and his Fox makeup was like, had this much impact, I think, in, in, the, in, in the minds of a huge audience of KISS fans. Diehards, yeah, they knew all about them. But by the time Peter Chris left after the farewell tour, these guys were not worrying about the diehard fans anymore. They no, were they because were it's they were changed. it was a completely different band in my mind, a different scenario, a different situation. They, but with they, the they, history they were, there they were building that but that with history, the history there, I disagree with you but, because but see, I, I think, think that history matters to them. They've clearly shown that by putting Eric and Tommy in the makeup. But see, I think that their relationship with Eric Carr was a little bit different. And because he had established his own character, you know, whereas Eric Singer had never established his own character any more than Tommy Thayer had, I think they would have given it the, the shot to see what happened. Now, maybe it could have changed again. I just again, don't but. feel like Eric ever really established his own character. I mean, he established Eric Carr, the drummer of Kiss, much more than Eric Carr, the fox. Because True, because there's did, more time he, without he, makeup he than there was much, with. You know, he did like, what, 80% of his career with Kiss out of makeup? Mm-hmm and a little bit in makeup and again those two albums flopped they didn't tour the u.s on one of them the one they did got killed the tour canceled early so his makeup was really not an issue and 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 again i think by 2001 kiss isn't worrying about the history of kiss anymore oh no i'm not saying they're doing it for that i would think that they're they're just they're worried about bringing somebody in to fill the character of the cat. Right. But and I here's think your that, opportunity, Eric Carr. If you want it, here's a paycheck. If you don't want it, no biggie. We're going to find See, I don't think they would have else. asked him. I don't think they would have asked him. I think they would have brought him back as the fox or they would have just found somebody else to do the Peter Chris thing. I, I don't think they would have gone that route. You know, but then again, it depends on how miserable well, he was. But, but time, I mean, they asked Eric Singer. Yeah, but Eric Singer never had his own character. That to me, that's they asked him if he wants. He they asked him if he wanted to come back into Kiss, and tour as Peter Chris. Right, which I get, but I don't think that they would have necessarily done that. You know, Eric Carr, Eric Singer, both hired musicians, not members of the band. I mean, literally, there's nothing different about those two guys, except for a couple extra letters at the end of Singer. And Carr didn't have quite as many, so. I mean, they're both Eric's. Now you're going to take some shit. They're both Eric's. They're both drummers. Direct all of your hate mail right to Michael. I mean, let's let, let, let's let's be honest. They were just yeah. hired drummers. But at the same time, like I said, it's also a possibility that, you know, who's to say that Eric would have stayed with him? He probably would have because why would you leave something like that? But he may not have wanted to come back. You know, like even Eric Singer said, I was really bitter for quite some time after that whole, you know, Well, sure. Let, 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 let's you know, so remember. Who knows? seems like Eric Carr was bitter um, you know at the end of his his life mm-hmm. anyway so he, right. he he may have just taken that as fine great get rid of me I'm I'm done and I'm Not. out of here um, I guess you know the big what if is the reunion would have happened it wouldn't have been I've heard some fans say well wouldn't they have just done a reunion 
with Ace and Eric Carr? Nope. No. 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 no, but no but listen, I'll take heat on this again. Nobody gives a crap about a reunion of Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, Eric Carr, and Ace Frehley in makeup. But I would agree with that. I'm talking about later on. It'd have to be the original four. It would have to be Peter. That's what made it work. I see the original. No, 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 four. no right, right. That that's so I agree that, with that. That's why that reunion happened. It, I could care less who was alive or in the band at the time. The original four members are what people wanted in their makeup. Mm-hmm. Nobody was screaming to get Eric Carr back in the Fox makeup, except for fifty people on AOL. Yeah, I, you know, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. And and by the time 2001 rolled around, the band had really taken this from being a live, active, creative band to a band that was recreating its past. Well, if we could get Gene or Paul on the show, we'll have to remember that that would be a question that we would ask. What? What would you have done? <laughs> Yeah, what would you have done? But, you know... But they can play the what-if game. Paul hates the what-if questions even more than we do. He doesn't even go that route because it's pointless to talk about it. Trying to paint him into a corner. Paint me into the corner. I'm going to be the asshole in this show. (laughs) You're always the asshole. I'm the asshole. (laughs) Yeah, what's your point? I'm always the asshole. Okay, so there you go. That's what we think about that. We disagree, and for different reasons. Would, you know, if Eric Carr came back in the makeup of Peter Chris, would it be a tribute band like it is with Eric Singer? Interesting question. I don't think it's a tribute band now. No, I don't either. But how would the fans have dealt with that? They'd be upset. It's just like they're always upset. And if they're not upset, they're going to find something to be upset about. You know? But again, the casual fans that go to see this band don't care. And I was thinking about that today on the way back to the uh, office. I was thinking, you know, was it you that said that Paul Stanley, you're at one of the rehearsals and they were playing Mr. Speed? Was that you that uh, said that? They played Making Love. Oh, make it love. Okay, so you said that he was smiling. They were all having a oh, great time. Oh no, 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 time. no. So, so two. I think two different things. I was at the sound check in Australia for the farewell tour, and they played okay. Mr. Speed at the sound check, and they were having a good time and smiling and everything else. The rehearsals for, which by the way kicks off tonight, the 40th anniversary tour kicks off tonight as we're recording yep. this. The rehearsals last week. Um, they played making love during the rehearsals and the word is gene has said every city they're changing things up sounds well, like uh, sounds like they're gonna maybe do something similar to the rock the nation tour which would be cool but we'll yeah but see. it's it's just not enough. And I, I know we're not going to get into set list, but the point or reason I brought that up is I was thinking about that, thinking, you know, if you're having fun playing these songs that you haven't played, then why aren't you fucking playing them? Because at this point, I really think the casual person that goes there, as long as they can hear Lick It Up, Detroit Rock City, uh, maybe Love Gun and Rock and Roll All Night, anything else you put in there, I just don't think it matters. So why not play some fun, different things? Not just one song a night, but half the set. Switch it up. People aren't going to leave disappointed because they're not coming there just for the music. A lot of these casual fans are coming and they're paying for the experience of seeing the full show. And whether you play this or that or whatever, I just don't think it's going to affect them one way or another. So, I don't know. The, yeah. the, the set list argument, which I'm sure we will have in our next, next show uh, after we've got some set lists will. under our belts... Mm-hmm. Just feels like that's a let me bang my head against the frickin' wall type oh, of yeah. discussion. Not mm-hmm. not even because it's not going to change, but because every single Kiss fan has a different set list opinion. Of I mean, course. it's funny, you know, when I post I post on Facebook about, um, hey, if they put making love in the set, would that be cool? Would you like that? And some people were like, yeah, that would be cool. And other people are like, oh, it's just not a deep enough track. It's like, oh, for God's sake. Yeah, but it's different. They, You're pl- not they, gonna they get... played it five years ago. I don't want to hear it. It's like, dude, well, seriously, what do you want to fucking hear? The Elder from start to finish? 
Yeah, I was thrilled when they played Strutter last summer. I hadn't seen him do that in a number of years. I was fine with that because it was different again. Yeah, I mean, I would be more than I would love to hear making love. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they've played it before. I don't have any expectations that they're going to play songs that have been never, ever played before so deep that people are going to be going, what the frick is that that they're playing? Right. That's not going to happen. And I yeah. told somebody, if that's what you want, go to the cruise. Right. That's what the Kiss Cruise is for. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the 40th anniversary tour is not for that. It's for the masses because they're playing with Def Leppard, and you better believe Def Leppard's going to bring all the hits. They're going to bring all the hits, you know. So I, I, it just, it just baffles me. It's just like, what do you, what do you really, do you really think Kiss is going to do that? Do you really, really think they're going to do that, or are you just bitching? Just bitching. Just I'm bitching. just bitching. Just bitching. So, what's but next? Let me up buy on the here? ticket anyway. I'm going yeah, to go to yeah. the show. I'm still going to go, even though I'm going to bitch about it. I'm going to go. You don't bitch. You're just Feels my like yes it. man. <gasps> yes, that's true. <laughs> Tommy, say yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> Tommy, Fuckers. stand up, turn around. <sighs> no, I can't do that. What? Because I'll get all twisted show? up. Yeah, I'll get all twisted up. Go on ahead, fire show? me. Go fire me. <laughs> Just fire me and see where you'll be. Yeah. All right, so onward Maybe and upward. Maybe the ratings will get even better if I get rid of another person. Probably not. The hole is bigger than the sum of its parts. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, what's next? Um, you wanted to chat a little bit about the 80s. Wasn't there a, oh, there wasn't one more question no, about these, that? Or yeah, that was these it? are both okay. of the questions. So okay. there, there you go, people. There's our what ifs around Eric Carr. You know, I'm sure some of you think we're full of shit. I'm sure some of you think I hate Eric Carr for the way I'm talking about him, but that it's, it's what if. And if you got other what ifs, send them our way. And maybe we'll do another what if episode. Yeah, and then also, too, as we'll go over it later, homework is what is your what-if scenario? What do you think would have happened? And, and none of this, I think, do, 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 do. you got to tell us why. Yeah. You know, if you, if you think that Eric would have worn the fox makeup, why? If you think they would have asked him to be Peter, why? Right. You know, give us some thing to argue about. I mean, and I, I would say try and base the what-if a little bit on some reality. I mean, like here... We've got the reality of the reunion tour and how that played out and how that ended and everything else, but that kind of gives you some indications of where they're coming from, what they were hoping to do, what they were trying to achieve. If you want to shoehorn Eric Carr into that, you know, use that information to help your decision. Mm -hmm. Just give us something to talk about. Yep. Um, Yeah, so... Mike and I typically don't know ahead of time what we're going to talk about. Just like when you meet a friend in a bar, you sit down, you just start talking. But every once in a while we have an idea, and to this afternoon it kind of hit me. I wanted to talk about, we've talked a little bit about this, but the transition from makeup to non-makeup and how I felt and how Mike felt about that time period because we both have, I know we're going to have completely different views. And how this whole thing started was Jason sent me this YouTube clip of Love Gun. And I don't know, I'm sure you guys can go on YouTube and find it, where it's Love Gun with all of the solos from every single guitar player that's been in the band, starting with Ace and moving all the way forward to Tommy. And that got me thinking, because I was listening to these, trying to decide, okay, which one do I like best? And I still like the Ace best because he's the original, that's where it starts, for good or for bad. And I thought the Bruce Kulick was pretty good in this as well and then Tommy too but, but and some people are like well Tommy just all he does is copy so what I, I expect when someone else replaces a member just like if I go see Ario Speedwagon I still really like Gary's solos and I expect Dave to play them very close or very similar to the way they were originally recorded but when I got to the Vinnie Vincent it, it just sounded like a swarm of bees and it just reminded me how much I hated that whole period. So I wanted to talk about what I remember of that transition. So do you want to go first? And, and Transition from makeup to no makeup. 
Well, you know, the, let's start with the elder. I want to talk about what your perception was of the elder when it came out, and then what your perception of the creatures was, and then moving from there into lick it up. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, I've said it before. I think the elder was an amazing era. Uh, you know, somebody actually just posted that on the um, the Brandvold Ilk group on Facebook today, and. Uh, it wasn't someone looking for funding. No. Okay. Just asking. <laughs> um, that's going to happen whether we support it or not. Um, I basically said, listen, I think The Elders was a great era. I loved everything about it. I, th I loved the costumes. I loved, I loved the image. You know, at the time, I loved the album. It's not a top 10 album for me right now anymore but when it came out I listened to it like I listened to any Kiss album and and I didn't and this is funny because as you were talking about the guitar solos in Love Gun it got me thinking how you know there's there somebody was posting like the um, on the Kiss 40 the reputation demo is well that's been re-recorded you can hear Gene's bass, it's different bass tone, and you can hear the Eric Singer drum tone to it. And I was just like, I can't hear shit. I hear a Kiss song playing, that's it. I hear a Kiss song with Gene Simmons vocals on it. Right. And I, if you gave me back to back two guitars of the same song, I could probably pick out the difference. But if you took out that comparison and just said, here's Love Gun, I'm listening to Love Gun. I don't know who that guitar tone is. I don't know that that's Ace Fraley or Tommy Thayer. I it doesn't matter to me. You know, some fans they can really get into that where I'm listening to the Elder and I can tell that that wasn't Ace Ace Fraley playing guitar on that, or I can tell it's just like I couldn't. I was listening to a Kiss song. You know that that's how I always looked at. I'm listening to Kiss. I don't know who wrote it. I don't care who wrote it. I don't care who recorded it. I don't care that it was different studios. Either I like the song or I don't like the song. And, and when Elder came out, I liked it. I listened to it a lot. You know, Dark Light, great song. I loved it. I loved it. World Without Heroes, loved it. And the fact that, that they, they were really ballsy and changed up their costumes as dramatically as they did had me just like, oh, my God. God, what are these guys doing? Another huge surprise. So in that moment, loved it. Now, when it went from Elder to Creatures of the Night, and I remember listening to Creatures of the Night going, holy crap, this is a heavy record. Almost too heavy. Almost too heavy at times. Because I like melodic rock. Right. I'm not, I'm not a fan of... Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, that type of stuff. There's some of those songs that I like, but that's not what I'm into. So there was points where I was just like, wow, this is just loud, heavy, fast. That's not Kiss. But yet it's good because it's new Kiss music and I'm listening to it. And again, I had no freaking clue that Ace Frehley didn't play one lick on that album. Not no, a single clue. Didn't, didn't ever phase me. See, and I remember thinking this doesn't sound like him at all. I don't get it. Normally, I'm not like that. The first time I noticed anything like that at all was when I was listening to Magic Touch on Dynasty. You could definitely tell that there was someone else singing background vocals. You know, that's when I noticed it the first time. For me, The Elder, I, I like the record, and I wanted to like it more than I did. And it's like there was about four or five tracks on there, the ones you mentioned, that I really liked. But the whole thing, like, with the Odyssey and a few of the other ones left me thinking, what, what's going on here? And it was almost like a guilty pleasure and a semi-embarrassment from a rock perspective. Because also, from that point of view, at that time, in 81... Van Halen puts out Fair Warning. Right. Um, and Cheap Trick has, um, well, they're not at one on one yet. That's next year, but they had their last record was All Shook Up. You have, um, you know, ACDC Black and Black in 1980, and then they didn't follow it up to, I think, 83 with something else. So, I mean, you had some really 
heavy records in there that were really, really cool. And then you've got this rock band who goes from watching you to something like that. So for me, it was just like, I was okay with the direction because you didn't know where it was going to go and it probably wasn't going to last in the same respect that I absolutely love creatures because it was just so full of energy. I would agree with you. I'm not, I don't like Iron Maiden. I don't like Judas Priest. It's not that they're not good bands. What I don't like about them is I don't like the singers. And it's not that Rob Halford isn't a great singer. So don't send me hate mail. I just don't like that operatic metal stuff. I don't like Queensryche. I don't like any of that stuff. I like melodic rock. So to me, Motley Crue isn't heavy metal. Motley Crue is just rock, you know, in the same fashion that Kiss is. And I know they were really heavy on that record, but I liked that they were kind of pointing the arrow back in the right direction at that point. Although I can remember thinking Ace, that doesn't sound like Ace at all. And I I thought... I I, I didn't because I've never dissected a Kiss album. That nor have I but that's my point that's how how flipping obvious it was to me I was just like but, but okay. still even for me at that point it still wasn't obvious I was just like oh Ace is on the cover it's a Kiss album <laughs> oh, it, seriously I mean yeah. that that it was new Kiss music um it, it, it I had no clue and like I said other times until I saw the concert ad and Ace wasn't in the ad I was like who is that did they give it I, Honestly, did they give Ace new makeup? Right. That was my first thought before replacing them. It's like, oh, they gave Ace new makeup. Well, do you remember the Creatures Tour? Oh, yeah. Okay, so what did you think of that? Because I remember, and I think I've told the story before, waiting in line at the Met Center to get tickets for the show, and there were people in line that didn't, there were hardcore Kiss fans that had never heard of Killers and had no idea that Ace wasn't in the band. So they really snuck him, snuck Vinny in under the radar. Oh, sure. Whereas they like de- their de- car, de- kids are people too, the whole nine yards and, and all of that. Right. So the I mean, concert. The, the, the Creatures Tour, you know, I got to be honest, whether it was crap or not, it was going to be the most amazing thing in the world because that was the very first Kiss concert I went to. Okay. So that was the very first time I was in the same building as Kiss playing music and watching just the the spectacle and the awe. You know, it, it, Vinny could have come out not in makeup and I would have been, oh my God, this is the greatest thing on the world. You okay, know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have had any impact on me because I was seeing Kiss. Well, and I think part of it too that made it more interesting as well is even though they were maybe having some trouble on that tour as far as attendance, they sure as hell didn't in Minneapolis because that place was packed with people. Yeah, and I remember just- think I remember thinking that, you know, like wow, they're you know because you were wondering if it's going to fill up or not because of the elder and all that. So, from the perspective of the show, it was phenomenal. It was a really really good concert. But when you're seeing them live, some of that stuff just kind of blends together. And I was just indifferent with the Vinnie Vincent thing. I didn't like it. I didn't hate it. I was just like, okay, whatever. Because I was so happy that Gene, Paul, and Eric were there. And I knew ahead of time that Ace wasn't going to be there. So had I not known that, I think I would have been a little frustrated. And, and, and see, I was happy that Kiss was there. Right. For me, it didn't matter who was in Kiss. I was happy See? Kiss was there. Right. That, and to that, me, it that's important. what mattered. I, that 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 Vinny was playing fast and furious didn't matter. I was listening to Love Gun live on stage. Right. I, that was just the most amazing thing in the world at that point in time. Okay. And, you know, and back to how you were shocked with the direction and what was going on with the Elder. It wasn't that big of a shock to me because, in my mind, they already had two albums under their belt that, in, to me, were even more shocking than The Elder was. See, and I didn't think Un- so because... Unmasked this... and Dynasty, were, to me, were even more shocking Kiss diversions than The Elder was. To me, The Elder sounded like a rock record, just had this weird undertone going to it. But there's no way in hell that Unmasked and Dynasty sounded like a rock record. If if you had come from Love Gun straight into Elder, might have been a what the fuck is this moment. But because you basically go from Love Gun, you know, you got the solo albums, but as a group album, you go from Love Gun straight into Dynasty. That was a big what the hell. 
Well, and, and then, I think and then, they, then you went even worse with unmasked. It's like where these guys are way off mark, way off mark now. Well, and I knew it was popular, but I think the difference for me is with with Dynasty as well as Unmasked. I like all the songs on both of those records, some more than others, but overall like both of them from beginning to end. The Elder was the first record that I didn't like about half of the album, give or take, you know. And then I thought that the the whole concept thing, I like the con- the costumes that I have no issue with that, but the the whole like hand on the door and no pictures of them and it just I'm just like really what what the fuck is this? And so at that point I was really going, oh great, here we go. What is going on? And then I liked some of the songs on the record a lot. I like the Oath. I really like I, um, you know, Dark Light. There's about five of them I really, really like. But it kind of left me, like I said, you'd hear all of those commercials, and they were it was the Odyssey that they were playing, and we're like, why are you not promoting the Oath or I? Because those songs rock. I get the whole world without heroes, but to me, that's a pop ballad in the same way Shandy is. So I agree with you. They lost their edge, but I think that was a turning point for me because about half the record, and then the guy in the record store at Knollwood Mall who hates Kiss. When I first came in there, he couldn't wait to tell me about how much he liked The Elder. And I'm thinking, oh God, all right, this guy hates Kiss, and now he loves this record. Something's not right. See, to you know, me, this, this to, is you know. To me, Kiss was getting more back to what they were about with the Elder, not further away. I think Dynasty. I think Dynasty on Mass took them as far away from what Kiss was as as at that time as could be imagined. And the because it glamorized them. It 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 not glam. It, it glamorized them. It 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 turned them into pop. It turned them into disco. It turned them into everything except for a hard rock band. But do you think that some of it, like remember you posted last week, it was that clip of the Australian 60 Minutes, and you said it's interesting what Bill Coin says around mile, you know, time right. mark four minutes and something. I almost wonder if some of that was somewhat purposely done to start to push them into pop more to get younger people interested and then turn that character and not the person more into the superhero that expands your marketing that expands everything i i would bet a lot of it was not so much that but we want to grow and be even bigger all right we are the number one band in america gallup poll rock band in america in 77 78 you know what can we do better well let's show everybody we are the biggest band in the world on pop and rock and everything else what's the next big monument that you have to you have to cross over to and you know even today that is cracking the pop world yeah you can be big in rock but you might be unknown in pop and if you become top of top of the pops i.e the show i mean you, mm-hmm. you've it that's it there's there's well, nowhere look what bigger ha- to go than to become the biggest pop band in the world well, look and at i'm what sure that's what extreme. they yeah that one song one song words, boom you know, and there was people buying their whole CD that hated the whole frickin' record, but bought it for that, for that one, one song. song. So you know, I'm sure between, I'm sure between the egos of the band members, i.e., Gene and Paul, management, Bill of Coin, and record label, everybody's like, um, we need to go even bigger and more flamboyant and larger. And you know, so what do you do? You, you know, disco's the biggest thing in the world, and as Paul said. I wanted to prove I could write a song just as good as all of them, and I did with I Was Made For Loving You. It was easy. Mm-hmm. Done. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, great. So you proved it, but that was such a diversion from a hard rock band. It killed, and, yeah, and also at the same time it killed the audience. And, and then Unmasked, basically almost being like a non-existent album in the U.S. Right. Um, and the content of it was even worse than Dynasty, in my opinion. Yeah, it was much poppier, and it was really lightweight, and you've got keyboards and all that. Yeah, so exactly. yeah, I just so 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 to me, the Elder came back and sounded more like a rock record. Yeah, it was just that for me, it was the whole concept thing, like Pink Floyd. You know, Pink Floyd it worked for them, but it doesn't mean that because it works for them, it's going to work sure. for everyone. Right. Okay, so then let's fast forward. So then Creatures comes out, you see the tour. We're both in agreement, very heavy record, definitely headed back in the right direction. But then at what point did you get to the 
what, how, what, when you heard they were taking the makeup off, what was your reaction? Cool. Okay. Cool. I'm going to see what Kiss looks like without makeup. You know, and, and, and at that point in time, you know, it wasn't being played out that they had to do it because nobody respected them in makeup, but you kind of felt that as a fan. If you'd been a fan for many years, you kind of felt like by that time, nobody was respecting Kiss. Even yep. after coming off of an album as great as Creatures of the Night. Which was virtually ignored. Virtually ignored. Um, heavy as crap. I mean, when, when, when you're listening to that going, this is as heavy as all the other stuff that's coming out right now, and they get ignored, except by heavy metal press. Kiss had no respect. So it didn't, didn't surprise me that they would take the makeup off. And it was just another, it was just another cool thing. You know, but by that point in time, it wasn't that I was going to see Vinny and Eric without makeup because who cared? Again, let let right, yeah, that was let's let's be honest. You know, Vinny was one one album, not even on that album, toured, and Eric was on one tour, and two albums that that bombed. Nobody cared about seeing Eric Carr. He's actually on two because he did the Unmasked tour. Well, yeah. Well, I'm talking about in the U.S. Right, but I have to make that stipulation or we're going to be getting Un- understood. 50 you emails. Know, keep in mind, people, a lot of what I'm saying is coming from me speaking as a U.S. fan. Yes, yes. Um, so I didn't care that I was going to see Eric Carr. It was Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley out of makeup. <laughs> that's pretty Oh, that's freaking, why you tuned in. That was pretty freaking cool. And then when I when I heard the this first single, Lick It Up, it was like, this is freaking great. It's great music. They they look cool until they got all made up for their tour look. Yeah, the see, I guess photos, I, the press photos looked awesome. Yeah, I guess I disagree with the look when I saw the video. I'm just like, ugh. and I know everyone was doing Mad Max, so we won't even go into that right now. But for me, I just was like, okay, whatever. But it was a real disappointment when I heard the record. I was very happy that the single did so well because like we talked about before, KQ was like, isn't it great? They can, pl- they sound wonderful. It's like, because the makeup's off, they sound great. My issue with the song itself was I always had an issue that there was never a solo in it. That always has bothered me. And when you listen to the record, I was, I loved Exciter. To me, that is the best song on that record, and it's still in my top 20 of all time. Would love to see him play it live. But for the most part, other than that song, the whole album was a throwaway for me. And see, it wasn't. See, I, I can, can't stand Exciter. Yeah, really? Yeah. I, I love okay. On the Eighth Day. Oh, and, and A Million to One. I like that one as well. Ah. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> freaking nails across a chalkboard. I mean, and see, and that's just, how I feel about like all hills breaking loose. Freaking and... hideous song. One of the worst Kiss songs ever. No, that would be I love it loud. No. But that's a whole other discussion. So, so for me, aside from those two tracks, it was truly a throwaway album. But I was so happy that they were on the radio, and it wasn't because it, you, you want them to be successful or not. I just wanted to finally have a little bit of validation that ha, look, they do put out some good songs that you know and you can't ignore, meaning to other people who are always giving oh, yeah, us crap yeah, I mean, about that, liking that, 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 that stuff. Because it's very easy to say you're, that was, you know. It's, go ahead. It, well, it's just it's really easy to say you're a fan of Def Leppard because they're on the radio 24 hours a day and so everyone's like, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, it was, you a, know? it was a great moment to be, listen, I've been a Kiss fan and now you're a Kiss fan too. Haha, ha, get behind me because I've been doing this for years. Exactly. So then let's talk about the tour. So the tour for Lick It Up came through Minneapolis about just shy of a year of the Creatures. So literally from the time I saw them on the Creatures of the Night tour until the time I saw them on Lick It Up was truly less than a year. Um, And they've taken their makeup off, new look, da 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 And I remember going there with some reservation but still excited to go and see this tour. And I remember just standing there going, God, they're just, they're, they're a shell of their former self. I thought it was one of the worst sounding tours I'd ever been to. They dropped, and I understand why, they dropped so much of the classic stuff and made more room on the new album than when I had seen in the past, which is understandable because they're making that shift. But I just remember thinking, okay, 
this is just not for me anymore. And again, the reason I'm saying this is that I'm also putting it in context with all these other bands that I'm going to see, because I don't think there was a band I didn't see during that time frame. Brandon and I, God, we I can't even remember how many concerts we've been to. And when you see someone like Van Halen and then Motley Crue with Ozzy in 82, it, this is so off, over the top cool that now I'm comparing this band to this band and Kiss used to give you every penny and it felt like they stripped it down to nothing and that especially Gene he I mean it he was lost oh yeah he didn't Huge. know and it was it, but it was that freaking obvious yeah. that I just it made me hate the record even more just because I'm like okay I don't get this this makes no sense to me they look miserable you know and and I always think back and I think god I wish they would have just if they were going to drop the makeup, just gone to like black leather and just gone, just strip down and really rock versus as it got more and more flamboyant as we go into the 80s. So for me, that's where they really, really lost me. And, you? And, and for me, it was another, holy crap, I get to see Kiss in concert again. I wonder why we had we have such different different experiences. I mean, was it, it was because just, I started before you, uh, it, and I it, had it, different? It could be. It, it could be that you just started before me. But you know, for me, it was just, oh my God, I get to see Kiss in concert again. Uh, it's it's just it's Kiss again. And for me, it was never about the individuals in the band, even when it was the original four. It was about a band. I'm going to see Kiss the greatest band in the world put on this most amazing show and play these songs I love um, I was disappointed that they just used the same freaking stage as the previous yeah, so I was, was just going to say that that was a huge letdown to me of like what? I just saw even this if it a was, year I saw this yeah, a year ago even if it was stripped down and they didn't have the tank it would have made more sense the tank worked with the makeup the tank didn't work, didn't work. In the, in, in the stage clothes they were having at that point in time. Now, it wasn't apparent to me at that point in time that Gene was just completely lost. It was still kind of overwhelming of like, oh, that's Gene Simmons. But I do have definite memories of, wow, is Paul Stanley just, he is a, he's all over the stage. He's just like felt, I felt like Paul Stanley taking his makeup off Instantly freed. was at home. Well, and, and, yeah, you're and, right. It freed him. He was so much more mobile. He danced. He moved. He was. It, it was just like there was the makeup didn't restrict him, but it also restricted him. So it was no big deal for him to just take the face paint off because he was still Paul Stanley. Yeah, he was a light at the end of the tunnel for me, definitely. But overall, and when I say it sounded bad, it wasn't a vocal thing. It wasn't a guitar thing. It was just the whole sound. And, and they see, literally... I, I, I never I never, never even noticed that. Again, I was just like, it could be as loud as freaking God. And I was just like, that's Kiss coming out of those freaking speakers. And my ears are going to ring for the next 10 days. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I'm gonna have Dane Bramage. I, I, it is. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay on my pillow and I'm gonna hear a squeal for the next three nights. It's just like, you know, and and I get to wear my concert T-shirt to school the next day and get my ass kicked. It's just, you know, it was the whole experience that was getting me. And uh, other than the stage itself, it was just wow, this is freaking kiss and concert. They, they're out of makeup. I get to see what they look like. Um, yeah, they're playing. They're you know I wasn't interested in classic Kiss tunes. I wanted to hear new Kiss. That was the new album. I want to hear new songs. Come on, play on the eighth day. Come on, come on. You know that's what I'm thinking. Right. And see, and I'm I I can't say that I was thinking that or not thinking that. And I'm not saying that if they played new stuff, I'd necessarily be against it. I just I think what it is for me is they went from such a cool, unique entity to a poor man's metal well, band. Sure, they had and to completely so, reinvent themselves. Yeah, and and the first draft was ugly. It took you know you know, you know think about it. It took Motley Crue or Van Halen ten years to get to that point. And here KISS had one year to become that band. Right. And and 
And clearly it was much easier for Paul Stanley because even in makeup, Paul Stanley was just playing Paul Stanley the rock star. Right. So makeup and no makeup, he's still Paul Stanley the rock star. Gene Simmons in makeup is playing a demon. Well, and somebody brought that up too. They wondered if if the first night of that the Lick It Up tour of Gene spit blood, and someone said that there's a photo of that. I have no idea if that's I, I, true. I, 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 don't I don't think it think happened. I think there's no. photos that look like it because of the lighting that it might have been Photoshop, but I don't think he ever spit blood. But you could def now, now when you look back, you can see he's moving on stage like he would if he was in his boots and his, in his yeah. mannerisms you know he he's now gene simmons but he's acting like trying to act like the demon and, and you're not and right. that that's I worse think, i think that that's worse and i think that's what took some of the momentum out of the band was here this other guy who was equally 50 percent of the band when it came to the stage presence because no disrespect, but there's no stage presence from Vinny or Eric Carr. Stage presence came from these two guys. 50% of it was lost. So yeah. it was all on Paul's shoulder to keep that stage presence going. Thank God. And, you know, you know, like it sort of proves how great of a front man and a leader he is that he was to keep able, the ball rolling. He, Again, it was just like he blinked an eye. One day he's in makeup doing it. Next day he's out of makeup and he's doing it just as good. Nothing mm -hmm. happened with him. Gene, on the other hand, you're like, what, what the hell? That's my grandpa up there all of a sudden. It's Gene totally. Simmons. But you're like, wow, it just doesn't feel right, does it? And, it? and honestly, I don't think he got it until the revenge tour. Yeah, I totally agree. And even at the Revenge Tour, there's still some silliness going on, you know. And then, like you said, now then with the Reunion Tour, now he's too much like Gene Simmons and can't remember how to be the demon, just like how he couldn't get away from the demon after they took the makeup off. Yeah. And maybe this is a, a hypercritical analyzation of the situation. It's just I wanted to talk about this because I feel like we haven't spent enough time talking about the 80s, even though it's not my era and you like it a lot more. But I think there's a lot of stuff that's worth discussing, and this is one of those things I've been thinking about a lot lately for whatever reason. So to me, it just, it, I don't know that I would necessarily have done it differently. I just remember being really disappointed. And, and, and I had zero disappointment because I would, even though I became a fan in 76, I would have to say I'm an 80s Kiss fan, not a 70s Kiss fan. Yeah, because seeing I'm a 70s I, I Kiss just, fan. You know, it was just another one of those. Then the next tour was like, oh my God, it's Kiss. I can go see Kiss again. And it's another Kiss record. And it's more Kiss music. And other people are like, yeah, but that song was co written by, you know, Desmond okay, Child. Okay. I'm like, I don't, how do I know who it was co written by when I'm playing it through my speakers? I don't. Well, and, and I kept going to the shows and I kept buying the records because I kept hoping it would get better. And, and by the time Hot in the Shade came out, I pretty much was just about done. And Hot in the Shade came out, there was a couple of good songs, but then when I went and saw that tour, that's what it changed for me. And we can talk about that at another time, and you know, we've kind of dug into it before. But yeah, it just I find myself thinking about that a lot, and I don't really know why, but I thought, let's talk about it today. Yeah, you know, it, you know? for me, it sucks that they basically ignore the entire age. Oh, and I'm not saying that they should, but I would also challenge you that I don't ever want to hear Tears Are Falling again. I don't want to hear that. No, see, I just, I'd re look, I'd rather Thrills hear Tears Are Falling. in the Night, I'd love I'd, to hear okay, that. Okay, I'd rather he hear either one of those over Lick It Up, okay? But overall, I just, whatever. Uh, you know, you know? I'll, I'll say Lick It Up is overplayed because they, they do, they play it a lot. But they have I, to. I, I would, I would. You know, I would love to hear basically um, anything off of Hot in the Shade, maybe Hide Your Heart, but I could go as far as saying you don't have to play anything off of Hot in the Shade. I like Rise to it, um, and I like Forever. It's, it's just a demo album is all it is. Mm -hmm. It was never finished. Um, Crazy Nights, we know what I think of Crazy Nights. I love that entire album. Um, mm -hmm. I think Asylum is a great album. I love uh, Animal Eyes. So I mean, I could, I could listen to anything off of those. Yeah, I, 
I guess I'd rather take anything off of any of those over hearing the same thing over and over and over again that we've got right now. I just don't want the most popular songs because those aren't necessarily the best. But, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it just, that's when things really shifted for me. And like I said, Benny was like, like I said, it sounded like a swarm of bees. Oh, yeah. You know, you know, back then... I thought it was great. It's Vinnie Vincent, the lead guitarist of Kiss. You know, you, you, you could have given me crap as the lead guitarist of Kiss, and it was Kiss. They did. They did. Looking <laughs> back at it now, yeah, they did. Well, yeah, because, I mean, think about Eddie Van Halen, okay? He plays fast, but he's very melodic, and he did something very innovative. Randy Rhodes, another one who came along that changed the face of music because of his style and his sound and the way he played. But... To me, Vinny was more like so many other people, like Ingve Melmstein, where, yeah, they're technically a whiz, but so what? That doesn't... He was here today and gone tomorrow. I mean, he, he literally had, had a blink in the blink of the eye in his lifespan of Kiss. That was it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, on that Lick It Up tour, I thought he was the best thing out there because he was the lead guitarist in Kiss. Right. That was, that was it. I was seeing Kiss, and he was playing those songs... This is great. Bruce Kulick comes along. Bruce Kulick is the best. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. To, to, no, I get you it. know, I, I guess I am an example of a fan that the band has always been bigger than the individuals in it for me. I've never been somebody who's like, it's got to be Ace, it's got to be Peter, it's got to be Gene, it's got to be. I could, that, it's never been that. It's always. It's always about kiss the band, kiss the attitude, kiss the energy, kiss, you know, that's what I was going to see. See, and the members are important to me because, especially if it's a guitar player, because they can really affect the way the band sounds. So to me, the best, that's why I didn't have a problem with Eric Singer, or I should say, I'm sorry, Eric Carr coming in as, as Peter's replacement because I viewed him as equally as good if not better in a different way i think one of the things that makes the early kiss album so good is peter's style of playing because i really like that jazz it, it makes it unique mm -hmm. it's not too heavy so then eric carr comes in and makes it much heavier but i'm okay with that too because he's a really great drummer whereas when ace left Vinny changed the sound of the band into a direction that I didn't care for. And it's not just Vinny. I would have said that if, if any band had a guitar player like that, because that's not the kind of music I like. I'm not saying that he's an awful musician. I'm simply saying I don't like the way he changed the sound. Bruce Kulig came in, and he was much less than Vinny, but he was, to me, real milk toast in the respect that, I, again, I'm sure he's a great musician. I'm not saying he's not. But for me, it's like they didn't do anything. The sound of the of the of the solos didn't do anything for me whereas i could tell you that the solos that mick mars was playing on the motley crew records were like wow this is really cool and i didn't see any of that until revenge and then when revenge came out i was just like bruce where have you been hiding this is freaking amazing totally different sound at that point and I also think that they all came together as a band and found themselves in that moment and I would have loved to have seen what they could have produced right after Revenge had they stayed on that course uh, I think you know, they lost I, a great record yeah I, I, I agree they they found themselves and finally became a band again but you know as I started with saying I never never listened to it as like the listening to the guitar solo listening to the drum tones listening to the head I'm not a musician in the at any sense. Right. So, you know, I couldn't I couldn't identify one drummer from another drummer. Well, and I'm not saying that I could when it comes to drums and bass so much as I can the sound of the guitar and the way it's played. So to me, that was something that I just picked up on good or bad. It's just like, you know, it makes total sense to me that they brought Rick Derringer in to do some of those parts on some of those records because he's got that classic 70s sound. I just I'm not I'm not a shredder. I don't Yeah, but, but you know what's kind of funny is you say that in 2014 but when they brought him in, it was the 70s. It wasn't that they were looking for the classic 70s sound. They no, were just I looking know, for a guitar player. 
but he fit in because it was similar to what everyone else was doing. I'm saying that once we got into the mid '80s, they tried to change it too much. From it's just it's no different than than um, when Mick Taylor left the Rolling Stones. They brought in Ronnie Wood for good or for bad. It's easy to say he was the perfect fit, but it just gelled. Now, granted, he's different than Mick Taylor, and I'm not the person to be saying who's better or different or whatever. But it just fits at least from my perspective. And I want something that fits, that is a square peg in a square hole, not a square peg in a round hole. And to me, the dynamics change and turned into something. Because I sat through so many of those opening acts, like Heaven and Vandenberg. And, oh, ugh, man, there were so many awful opening bands I sat through. And a lot of them had the same kind of common denominator. Was this? It's like okay, is the guy gonna explode or what? You know, it's just that was that was eighties, right? But look at Steve Vai. What Steve Vai did with David Lee Ross band and his first solo album and Billy Sheehan, that was now he's as good as they get, I think, and that was amazing because it it was played with style. There was something, there was substance to it that was lacking. Just my two cents. You I, you know, I couldn't tell you if Steve Vai was on a David Lee Roth album or some tribute band. Mm-hmm. That's okay. You know, it just, it's just one of those things where they just, that, for whatever reason, the guitar playing catches my ear. You know, but you know, we should have someone on sometime, and I have an idea of someone I'm going to contact and do a show about Kiss and their guitars. Okay. Because I think that would be interesting to some fans to talk about the different gear that they've used and, and the tone and the sound and why things are different and blah, 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 blah. You're on it. Do it. Okay. I'll work on it. So uh, anything else? Um, yeah, I'd like to... Back to our what-if question. What-if question. I'd like to know if you th- how you think it would have played out with Eric Carr. So what, Not what, so what, much what, revenge. What, 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 I know. What, yeah. What if Eric Carr hadn't died what would have happened and we're assuming that he was with him all the way through to the unplugged and eric was eric carr was playing at the unplugged show with right. bruce kulik and this happened what, what do you ha- think what would have happened with the reunion tour if eric carr had been alive and still in the band yeah i think that would be a good one and if you want to comment on the you know the, the shift from makeup to non-makeup you know chime in as usual like yeah. enjoy and we'll, we'll um, you can leave your comment at facebook.com slash three sides of the coin youtube dot three sides of the coin dot com spreaker dot three sides of the coin dot com um, leave your video message on three sides of the coin dot com um, tell me I'm uh, an idiot for hating Eric Carr whatever you want I don't hate him I would have to say I don't hate him but I'm also not a big fan. He was just a drummer in Kiss. Oh, he I really can see was. the hate mail. I can just see the he mail really coming was. your way. He was, he was just a drummer. They're going to chase you down the street with fire. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Just I don't think that what it is for me. Homes in Sausalito that are on fire. It's like, oh, no, they're just chasing Michael Brandville down the hill. That's, that's the truth. Okay, live with it. I can. Can you guys live with it? Can you live with the fact that I just think Eric Carr is a drummer and nothing more to kiss? This is going to be interesting. Some people aren't going to be able to sleep knowing that. Mm -hmm. It's going to drive them nuts. (laughs) I know everyone behave. Say it in a respectful manner. We don't need trouble. So, Uh, and we got, oh, we got a special guest coming up for you guys next week. Yes, next week, another special guest. Mm-hmm. We stole this idea from another podcast. <laughs> We're not going to give them credit. Yeah, not at all. We're just going to add that's the kind of, idea. kind of the assholes we are. Totally. We're just like, we just sit around and go, hey, here's another good idea. And steal it from them. Exactly. All right, guys, that's it. Leave us your homework online. Until next week. Later. Get your Three Sides of the Coin t-shirts now available and shipping worldwide. Head over to shop.threesidesofthecoin.com.
Download a free copy of the ebook, KISS School of Marketing, 11 Lessons I Learned While Working with KISS. Head over to noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold.